all for being here today. My name is Erin Payton, and I'm the Executive Director of the 19th Century Charitable Association, which is located in Oak Park, Illinois. Our mission is strengthening our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. And we have another wonderful program for you today. Uh, before I get to it, just a couple things. If something sparks a question or a comment during the program, you can go ahead and leave that either in the chat or the Q&A. And if there's time at the end of the program, we will come to you and actually unmute you and you can ask the question or provide your comment. But without further ado, before I bring these two gentlemen, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. Chang Ray Lee is the author of a bunch of novels, Native Speaker, Adjust Your Life, Aloft, The Surrendered, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and On Such a Full Sea, which was a finalist for the NBCC and won the Heartland Fiction Prize. His novels have won numerous awards and citations, including the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award, the American Book Award, and the Barnes and Noble Discover Award, ALA Notable Book of the Year, the Annisfield Wolf Literary Award, the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award, and the NAIBA Book Award for Fiction. He has also written stories and articles for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Time Asia, Granta, Condé Nast Traveler, Food and Wine, and many other publications. Wow. Bill Young is the proprietor of Midwest Media an author services company providing escorting and support to most of the authors visiting in Chicago and surrounding areas. Since 1987, he spent more than 8,000 days on the road with anyone from former presidents to authors to all sorts of different people. In the late 1980s, he was the producer host of the baseball show during the early days of cable television. A longtime resident of Oak Park, Bill recently became a member of the 19th century and in May, he is joining our board, which is really exciting. So without further ado, let's welcome these two gentlemen. Hey, Bill, good to see you. Uh, just to, to begin, when I started this conversation about getting here, we were talking about the logistics of uh, you doing this from Italy. So I'm really sorry that that fell through. And I wonder, <laughs> yeah. have, you, have you been traveling at all? Uh, well, we actually did get to Italy last fall because uh, this is my sabbatical year. I teach at I teach uh, at Stanford, and so I'd had all this, you know, all these plans. I usually, you know, situate myself somewhere nice and work and do research, working on a new book. But of course, this year was kind of messed yeah. up and. But uh, we did, we were able to uh, get a special dispensation and get in for a little bit. And, uh, but now I'm back home here in San Francisco. Well, I'm really sorry. And then, and then of course, losing uh, the usual promotion uh, opportunities for a new book. Uh, Zoom came out of nowhere. And I think it's, uh, it's been good for you. And it's certainly been good for me because I can no longer spend time with authors. And this has become a a, a surrogate thing to do, but <laughs> yeah. really enjoyed it. Uh, you're here for my year abroad, and it's a, it's a novel epic in scope, unlike anything else that you've done. And it's about multinational business. It's about uh, you know entrepreneurship. Um, and it goes, we're gonna talk a lot about that and from various uh, various characters of various situations. But uh, this is a tease because I'm gonna give away something, but it takes place on page one. So, and that is the characters uh, Tiller, who's gonna be the protagonist throughout the book and, and on both of these stories. He is in, he's with a, he's about a 20 year old college student. He's with uh, an older woman, a woman in her thirties and, and a, her son named Victor Jr. And they're in the witness protection program. So I'll leave that there <laughs> and we'll get that. What is, 
what it is. How do they get to the witness protection program, or he gets to the witness protection program? But basically, this is a story told by two characters. Uh, and can you introduce the characters of Tiller and Pong Lu? Well, yeah, Tiller is this uh, kid who's supposed to be going on his junior year abroad, semester abroad, your typical kind of thing, you know, in Europe somewhere, Barcelona or uh, or Florence. Uh, but he does, he's uh, not really into it. And he meets a fellow in the town that he lives in. He lives in a place called Dunbar. And it's you know, pretty much modeled after Princeton, New Jersey, nice college town, uh, you know, kind of Tony, prosperous. And, but he's, Tiller himself is uh, someone who doesn't feel very elite or talented or interested in all that much. He's very attentive and uh, observant, but he's kind of at loose ends. Um, and he by chance meets, uh, a Chinese businessman who lives in town named Pong Lu, who uh, really captures his imagination. He's uh, this fellow, this this guy Pong is, um, you know, he's not some kind of oligarch or billionaire, but he's got a, a finger in every pie, I suppose. Uh, he's got lots of little businesses, lots of interests overseas. He's a chemist by training, so he has a full-time job, but he's got all these other things going on. and. Uh, he invites Tiller along to go on a, uh, a little junket, business junket to Asia, stopping in Hawaii. And, and from there, they, they kind of have uh, what I would say is their, you know, kind of picaresque adventures uh, the, for high, low. To say uh, the least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of eye-watering and startling things happen. Yes, no, yes this would be like Ferris Bueller powered by a nuclear reactor <laughs> yeah it's a little bit like that it's a little bit like that and um and it turns out they're a good pair because uh tiller is is as he begins to find out quite open to experience and I, I mean you know the word i would use is vulnerable but in a in in every way in a good way in a in a dangerous way in a really generous hearted big soulful way um, and Pong, of course, is someone who's who is going to guide him through the you know the the sights and sounds and tastes uh, and smells of this of the world that they they end up finding themselves in. Pong is one of the most interesting characters I, I've read. He's a guy who's uh, looking for he's at ease in doing things well and it come things come easy to me they meet on a on a golf course uh, tiller's extra job is a is a dishwasher but he's he's he, he's caddying for this group of businessmen uh playing around a golf golf pong who's never played a round of golf in his life and doesn't even know how to hold hold the club and by the 18th hole he's powering the hole yeah and uh <laughs> That's an example of the many things he does. He's he's this local entrepreneur in Dunbar. He's got a, a string of frozen yogurt shops. The, I love the, the WTF yo yogurt shops <laughs> and uh, car washes and stuff like that. A hot dog shop, which you would love. Uh, yeah, well, what? Because I know you're a hot dog. Aficionado. He's got some tofu place in an Amish village, I think. Yes. It's, it's, yes. Yes. So you had, did you have fun in sort of the uh, the sort of comical exaggeration of, of uh, some of this, the business side sideline? Well, well, what's amazing was that it's not so much of an exaggeration. I met a, uh, he's, Pong is modeled on a friend of mine uh, who is just like him, uh, you know, this guy who is, you know, very, very personable, um, but really what what he is is he's just ever capable ever curious you know he he's really irrepressible in terms of his interest and this the real fellow that he was based on and and this real fellow you know just like pong had all these kinds of different things going on all at once and uh, you know he was an you know maybe not an expert in anything but uh super competent and uh and game for everything 
And, and I just love that energy. And it's more about that than the business itself, ultimately. I, I just, there's something about this businessman that really inspires young Tiller. And I guess inspired me and, you know, uh, made me feel as if, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching and I write, but I felt kind of like, uh, I don't know, just kind of a, a bump on a log, I suppose, <laughs> compared to this fellow who, who, you know, just looking out at the world, looking out at the landscape, just saw all these interesting opportunities. And also, and the most charming part about him was he really sort of like loved meeting people and finding out what they liked and finding out what they wanted and 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 maybe providing it you know and so i that kind of energy and exuberance uh, was something that i just wasn't seeing a lot of and especially what liked seeing that in this kind of new immigrant you know an immigrant who didn't feel as if he was coming over to a country where he would feel cowed and alienated but in fact in a place where he was really kind of in command um, and, and again, not because he had all the money in the world, but he had all the, the energy and, um, and, you know, and focus. Can I read what, just a paragraph that you wrote about him? When we talked on, on Friday, I said, what was it going to ask you to read? Because it's an awkward thing to do on Zoom. But I love this. And it kind of sort of sums up. And then I'm going to ask you a question about his background. This is about Pong. He was comfortable shuttling between his shops in Dunbar Village or riding the swill off the south shore of Oahu or addressing his golf ball on the very first fairway that he ever strolled, moving with unhurried purpose like this was his very own planet. This was one of the reasons took, people took so readily to him that wherever he was, whatever he was doing, you got the idea that he was meant to be there, that this was his gig. Yeah. Which is exactly what you just said, but I think yeah. those are this that is the way you wrote it in the book. But he's a tie in with the previous books, the ser your, your serious early work, where you're talking about uh identity and and uh and immigration and and uh you know the past in another place. He is. His background is for, he came through the Chinese Cultural Revolution. He grew up, he was a child in the 1960s. And uh, his family was really displaced. His, his parents were accomplished and lost that. Uh, and he ends up in New Jersey and has a very poignant experience as he is the mentor to Tiller his mentor, the woman who gives him the opportunity is this, this woman named Ling. Uh, can you say about, a bit about that? This is where he came from before he was able to be the, the entrepreneur. What was the, the catalyst for uh, his breaking out? Yeah, I wanted to, to explore his backstory too. You know, obviously what you mentioned about his family and their troubles during the Cultural Revolution, especially as his parents were uh, artists and uh, intellectuals. And of course, um, they were like so many during the Cultural Revolution, just squashed, uh, crushed. And, um, but he ends up finding his way to America and and it, like a lot of people, has to make his own way, uh, and also, you know, probably most pointedly, you know, create himself in a way, recreate himself, and and he does that actually, literally. He 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 ends up. And I won't won't give away too much, but he ends up uh, in some ways becoming someone else so that he could become himself if that's not too mysterious a sentence <laughs> but i think uh, i think a lot of uh newcomers have to do that right they don't have a, a safety net they don't have means uh, all they have is the way to just curate everything that they can and what they understand and bit by bit build up a, enough of a foundation so that they can move forward and and that's the kind of story that that's always appealed to me and does have a connection to to my other books. Um, this book, as you mentioned, is a, a lot more comic, um, although I think has some serious parts to it in, in terms of looking at, you know, where, you know, what people have in terms of their legacies and how those legacies 
you know, never really leave them uh, and can't, you know, and that they can't leave uh, for, for better or worse. The, uh, you're, you're right. And the, and the arc of the, the business adventure is fairly straightforward as they move from, with a group of investors from New Jersey to Hawaii to uh, mainland China. But then the parallel stories is with these uh, interesting characters in the exaggerated situations like the surfing and the, and the, the, the 36 hour casino adventure in Macau or, or the huge business complex that this all becomes. Uh, but how did that evolve the, the, the sort of comedy part of that where everything is not just like after they, after they complete a round of golf, they just don't go and drink. They go yeah. and do, you know, something with the, the, the rarest of scotch or fine food or. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, one, of, one of the things that I wanted to try to get to in this book was uh, the, um, this gravitational, the gravitational pull of, of excess and consumption and just trying to go out and and grab and consume something of the world while you have it and and so there's a lot of that going on in this book of course you know we all know businessmen can sometimes uh, go overboard i mean i don't know i'm not a huge gambler but i know plenty of guys who spend 36 hours in a casino <laughs> straight. oh sure but probably <laughs> but, without snorkeling in shark tank <laughs> yeah, which i've done by the way i've snorkeled in a shark tank <laughs> gotta, uh, <laughs> tease with all this yeah it yeah, felt but, a lot more and i know it's not the book is timeless in the sense is that it, it doesn't necessarily play, take place in the last four years in the turbulence of American politics. But it is very much like the end of the 80s, the Gordon Gecko breed is good Wall Street, mm -hmm. which is actually a time you were actually on Wall Street briefly. Very briefly and, and did meet lots of personalities like that, right? Uh, uh, people, mostly men, uh, not you know, at, you know, at that time especially, uh, who were you know real sharp characters, uh, <laughs> had a lot to say about everything, uh, had an angle on everything, and I, I think I've I've never I've never really um, you know they've never left my imagination, you know those kinds of folks, um, and, and they were kind of folks that you see in 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 bellow novels, you know, uh, and, and other, other, uh, other books that, and uh, literatures that, that always appealed to me. So, so I, I think I've, I, I never thought that I would write a novel based in business, but because I'm, I'm so not a businessman myself, but, um, but I like the energy and, and edge of those folks. And because sometimes, and of course, in, in fiction, you want to, you intensify all that and push them to, to, to into situations where um, that energy and that edge, you know, has many faces and can turn into something, you know, revelatory, grotesque, you know, just uh, literally sensational where you're just feeling lots of things. And that's one of the things that, that I wanted to, the, I hope well, that the book would do is it be be a sensational, be an actual viscerally kind of affecting book for the reader, um, uh, you know, to put everyone kind of through their paces. I was actually going to ask this later, but to me, I, when I went back and knowing everything that would happen, it actually seems like a book of short stories, interconnected stories, in the way that the episodes are are self-contained, you know, they're like 30 page chapters of mm -hmm. uh, some of the episodes that we talked about Did you, in terms of writing it. And I know you're, you go back a lot. Were the, did you write it in the sort of self-contained scenes? Uh, well, 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 I think this is something that I um, was doing in my last book on such a full sea and 
and and enjoyed and and like the I like the progression of the, the episodic in a way that I hadn't before, or I, I was starting to appreciate it. And uh, in the last book, you know, there, it's a, it's also kind of an adventure tale where the, the heroine goes out into the world and, and meets all these kinds of strange creatures, people, you know, situations. And, and I like the, I like the feeling of, of that, of not quite knowing w- what, they were going to what she was going to find what she was going to have to say or do and and in in this way i think i found the same mode um you know that it aligned with this story too where he's going out in the world and of course you know i want the the episodes and the incidents to be startling and uh, and fun um and also most important you know kind of surprising you know i didn't want you to be able to say Hmm, he's here and this is what's going to happen at the end. Oh, of that's it, right. <laughs> so oh, that's door, for sure. Every door that opens, it should seem like a door that is probably familiar, but then the room you're in is is a fun house. And, uh, and that was the kind of thing that, that um, uh, I guess the kind of the move that, uh, that I wanted to make in, the, in this book. And, and I, I found it just quite fun. Basically. It was fun. And a lot of it, there's a lot of science in there. Uh, Pong is a, is a chemist. Uh, and he is always trying to perfect something that is for the good of people, whether it's frozen yogurt flavors or uh, uh, elixirant, which is what they are going to China for. This is a, a, health, a health drink. A health drink that's going to be sold at spa at the uh, yoga spas i mean everything mm-hmm. about this is healthy living and then he the the last character here that i'd like you to define is one of my favorite names in fiction uh uh drum capagoda <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and they've met in in the united states but he has this complex in in and uh, in China, and he is the he is the guy they're going to see. Yeah, and he's the fellow. He's he's the counterpart in this business venture that they have to sell this health drink all across Asia. And and Drum Capagoda has uh, you know a, a interesting background himself, part Sri Lankan, Chinese, lots of other things. Um, maybe a bit of a gangster, uh, but also someone who's uh, who's dying and who doesn't want to die (laughs) like everyone else and and maybe in pong has found someone who who gives him uh, can has has uh at least held up the promise of perhaps a special elixir not a health food drink that would just uh you know for wellness but but a true elixir uh you know a mystical one that that maybe can extend life um and so in the end, they, they, this whole other story comes, comes into it, which is, uh, again, you know, kind of mysterious, um, a little bit wild. Yeah, uh, all I could do is scary. put, on the, put them in the complex and uh, not <laughs> yeah. divulge anything after that. <laughs> right, right. But I wanted, again, I wanted to just to, in, in writing this story and writing these characters, I, I, I enjoyed letting go, letting them go to places where um where i didn't think they'd ever go and and that was part of the the pleasure and i think part of the point of it too which is again you know the especially with a fellow like drum who's interested in ideas and and situations of extremity um you know what are the extreme capacities of the human body he has this unhealthy i think interest in yoga uh and 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 so that again i wanted to push all these characters all these people both in in mind and flesh uh, to to an extreme where well you know maybe some reckonings and some revelations would come about the last time i ask you about him is the uh, i'm sure you like karaoke about as much as i do before <laughs> and we've talked about that but tiller is a guy who's very reticent about 
karaoke and one of these extreme bacchanalian evenings that these guys have is they go to this place called what garbo karaoke yeah. and it turns out that tiller is like caruso in a, at karaoke <laughs> and he's in demand and he bonds with drum Kappa yoga who because of his ability to sing karaoke uh, drum gives him a, a playlist and, and yeah. on and on yeah how did the karaoke scene evolve with this story what well, you know, they're going to Asia with a businessman. So inevitably you have to end up in a karaoke room at some point. But, but the question of course is, well, what can go on there? That's kind of interesting. And, um, and I'd of course been in karaoke rooms. I, you know, I, I, I you know, visited to Asia and Korea in particular, and, and I'm a terrible singer. Um, I hum very well, I think in my head and in tune, but I'm, I'm just not, I can't carry a tune with, with You're my half voice. a step ahead of me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I wanted to again put put Tiller in situations where um, he would he would discover things about himself. Again, he's someone who's doesn't feel he's terribly exceptional at anything, and and it's partly because he's never tried uh, anything. And and I like the idea that that Pong and the, and the world in general. Can bring things out in in us, you know that that actually humans are incredibly um, talented uh, in so many ways that they don't quite know, right? Um, and so I wanted to put him in a situation where he was forced to sing, but um, and he's you know he thinks back to his mother, his uh, his disappeared mother, who who was a beautiful singer, and he talks about that. Uh, and it turns out, of course, that he's he's you know he he has a has something from her and 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 belts out a few things that that surprise him most of all and um and is i guess his entree into the world of drum cap pagoda and and everything that will happen after that we can't go further in, in china but uh that story comes in introduces on his it introduces Teller to Val and Victor Jr. And that is the story, the book begins with them and they go many episodes within the book, but uh, they mentioned they're in the witness protection program, not sure exactly where the town is named, Stagno. Yeah. Uh, but I just wanna read, this is a, a paragraph that I want to, it's, Chef Vic cooked wildly from Thai to Moroccan to Chinese Korean. His jang, Jenga Mion with homemade sauce and noodles was epic and somehow possessed the savvy and confidence to cross fertilize as in a Peking duck risotto finished with black truffle butter. This is a chef who is eight years old. <laughs> yeah, so... It's, so yeah, so in this storyline, you know, everything that happens in the business travels in Asia has actually happened in the past. And, and now he's in this storyline with Val and her son, Victor Jr., who's, who it turns out to be this, you know, child prodigy chef, you know, again, a kid who is kind of a monster, you know, spoiled, uh, you know, petulant, and they find, luckily, that the, he has this, you know, interest and talent uh, in cooking. And so they end up, even though they're in witness protection, and it's one of the anxieties of that story, which is Val is supposed to be in witness protection for something that her husband did and that she snitched on, but she's sick of it. She wants to break out of this, this, you know, this hiding. Um, and of course, the worst thing that they can do is what they end up doing, which is they opened up a kind of pop-up restaurant in their own house which is <laughs> lines around the block <laughs> yeah so <laughs> inviting all these strangers in which gets uh, tiller very nervous of course because out in the world before you know he met her he's you know he's experienced a lot and so he's afraid for her it turns out of course that uh the dangers are not external but um but from within 
in 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 their life and uh, in her psyche, and so uh, so it's just a way for me to have fun with uh, with some cooking stuff, but but again um, to to try to you know to try to see how people are you know get obsessed about things and get interested. Well, and he's in sort things. of like the counterpoint to Pong. Pong is a young man as he perfects things and the confidence he's got. Yeah. a quiet confidence about him at eight years old. And he is. He is. And and, and you know another sort of amazing creature, uh, which I think we you know I was always what well, one of the epigraphs of the book is uh, you know that that we all need heroes because we don't know you know we're 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 all such just such normal people um except we're not and and we need these heroes and ideas of 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 the capability extreme capabilities of certain people to to give shape to our lives and um and so that's what i was hoping to do with with a lot of the characters in this book and the food and the the food in both sides of the book too is something that you're interested in you're i think you're a very good cook well i like to cook i like to eat i like to drink wine and uh so i you know i've just been you know people always ask me you know if you could have done something else besides if you had to do something else or could have done something else besides writing what would have been in it and I always say it probably would have been in something in the food or restaurant industry, you know, or wine in the wine industry or something, because I, uh, I'm just a, a creature who, you know, who, who is guided by his tongue and uh, <laughs> his nose. So, you know, that's, and that's just my basic day, right? I mean, that's, that's my, that's my, that's my sort of typical typical living uh, which is just you know going from one meal to the next and, and thinking about it yeah i understand <laughs> we've done it we've done it together <laughs> you know when i met you 20 years ago and i i don't, I don't remember thinking this with uh, just your life but with the loft i remember it was the first time you wrote about a character who wasn't Korean American or, or, or tie into to Korean Asian history. And it was uh, an Italian guy in Westchester County when you grew up. In Long Island, actually. It was that Long Island? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you had the voice of an older man. You were connected to uh, the literature of a generation older than you it felt like updike or cheaper or richard yates or dr o uh, were you you must have been very appreciative of them growing up to have achieved that that voice at an early age oh absolutely i mean you know those all those people you mentioned, a lot of my literary heroes and uh, idols, um, and and you know when when you're the, no matter who you are, you're you know in terms of your ethnicity, your background, immigrant status. Uh, I had a certain reading, right? There was a certain canon that <laughs> I had moved through. <laughs> And that started from, of course, you know, all the all the classics of Western literature and civilization. So, um, but one of the things that you know, aside from you know, Iliad and all that, but one of the things, one of the kind of, I would say, um, kinds of music in my head, because I always think of literature as music too. You know, I always the the writers that I love, I I can just I I can hear their sentences i can hear their the cadences i can hear their tonalities and and one of the things i always loved was uh was uh the poetry of milton and um you know to, to and and you know he, he his predominant use of blank verse uh which unrhymed iambic pentameter and, and in some ways aloft and and a lot of and a lot of the uh literature that the, and voices that I loved, American voices, um, you know, kind of had that cadence to it. Uh, and, and it's just kind of built in, ingrained. Uh, and yeah, it's not my background, it's not my tradition, but of course, 
it is it 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 ended up being my intellectual tradition you know where i started from and um and so it's you know it, it, that was a book that it particularly aloft uh was a book that was uh, maybe a love letter to to aside from the story a love letter to to all the writers that i loved and and the music that they've given me and you've been uh you've been teaching now for uh 20, 20 years, yeah, uh, Princeton more, more and Stanford, yeah. uh, and yeah. encountered a number of the people we were talking about just in the in the faculty. I mean, at, at Princeton, you must have been with Toni Morrison, Joyce Carol Oates, Edmund Everybody. White, yeah, sure. Uh, in sure. a Stanford, Tobias Wolf. Yes, yes, absolutely, and uh, you know, and you know, I, I recently reread Old School by Tobias uh, Wolf, a great book. Uh, and uh, I was reading it. I, I picked it up because I, I, I wanted to read another, uh, to remind myself of stories that were set in youth, but in, um, you know, kind of a intentional community, you know, like a school or camp, because uh, I'm interested in that. And, uh, uh, but, you know, again, it, these are, you know, again, these are writers that, that, you know, I can't, I can't sort of turn off that music inside. And they, they, it's not that they're all the same, of course, but, but certain sentences of, you know, to Toby's and certain Hemingway sentences, certain sentences from, you know, Yates or Richard Fort, they're all there, right? Um, and, and uh, along with sentences from people like Toni Morrison. And, <laughs> but yeah, you're the conduit. I mean, you were the guy of all the people that I mentioned, most of them are emeritus by now. You were the guy still in the classroom. So uh, you're imparting this. You This is part of, uh, I guess, a teaching method, right? Sure. And, and you know, I, although I'm not teaching a lot of that work, uh, whatever I end up teaching, um, you know, I, I teach lots of different courses, but I make sure that um, that my students that we read the, read the work sentence by sentence by sentence. I'm not one of those teachers who you know assigns two big novels a week and want them to be give me you know smart ideas about what all that means. Um, you know, I I I really want them to appreciate what is going on, what what the writer was trying to do. Um, but of course, both in story and structure, but 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 uh, as primarily, uh, you know what, how those sentences are put together, and and how the and how they proceed and and build into something um, more than, of course, just a story or a character. It's something else exists. Some some other beauty is emerging, right? I had the same conversation two months ago with Richard Ford, saying the same thing that you yeah. that you have to look at it equal side by side. They have to both work the story and absolutely, the language. absolutely. Uh, and that's what I think. That's what really good writing. That's what worthy literature is, right? Um, uh, it's, and, and again, there's not a certain kind of language where there's, you know, the writers as, as varied of Toni Morrison or, or Charles Dickens, right? But there's, but there's a, vi there's a certain distinctive vitality and energy and point of focus in their works that, that gives us a new perspective on just being alive. And, and that is what you know, we readers of literature, uh, the close readers of literature, that's what I'm hoping to, uh, to guide my students in. And the, the question, um, we talked about your academic career now, and I know that you've, uh, you went to uh, Exeter and Yale, and then after Wall Street, you ended up in Oregon. I'm just wondering how, and that was your MFA, and yeah. that's where you did the thesis that turned into the first book, which yes. won the Penn Hemingway. So, what was, what was the, uh, the pull for you to to go to Oregon? Well, there wasn't a pull; it was a, a recommendation uh, from a friend in New York. I was in New York City, uh, you know, having written a failed novel, 
you know, kind of, you know, my mother had recently died after a long illness and I was just kind of, you know, uh, a lot like Tiller actually just didn't know what to do and, or why to do anything. And um, I knew I wanted to write and, and this friend of mine, a writer named Patty Dan uh, had gone to University of Oregon, not as an MFA student, but just as an undergrad, she was in New York. And she said, you know, and I asked her, should I go to a writing program? She said, well, I don't know if you should go to a writing program, but you should get the hell out of New York City for a little while because <laughs> cause you're in a rut and you need something fresh. And she said, why don't you like look, go to Oregon? That was a nice place for me and a totally different landscape and feeling and uh, maybe things will be clearer for you and it was the best advice I got so I you know back in the day I did there was no internet really I I just looked up you know programs out west including Oregon and and applied there just never having been to Eugene Oregon and and I ended up getting a small uh you know, graduate fellowship to go there. And, and so it, I thought, hey, I'll go there. Turned out, of course, I met a, uh, a great mentor and friend of mine, Garrett Hungo, who's a, um, you know, wonderful oh. poet and essayist. And uh, he was a real artistic and personal mentor for me. And, and uh, so it, it was faded and I met my wife there. And so it was, uh, so you know, in a way, it was it was a great place to go, even though the, it it wasn't really purposeful in the, except to just you know get out of what I, where I was. <laughs> but it turned out to be perfect, a perfect. And that place. is where the, the that is where native yes, speaker I, yeah, the thesis. I wrote, yes, I, I started that as my MFA thesis, and it turned and, into the Penn Hemingway. Yeah, it turned out okay. You mentioned your mother. Um, we just watched Coming Home Again mm. last night, a film that just released now. It's two years old. You wrote it. It's about your mother, your family. Well, I, um, I didn't, I should correct you. I didn't write the movie. Um, and this is the funny story about it is that Wayne Wang, the director, um, had read my essay. It's based upon an essay that I wrote about um, my mother and myself um, for The New Yorker many years ago. And he said, I'd love to make a movie about it. Um, and I said, sure, go ahead. And he actually ended up doing it all, almost improvising things in the way Wayne Wang sometimes does, you know, like he did with Smoke, with the actors, you know, they all read the essay and they kind of just did it. Uh, later on, after the first cut, I came in because I, I think we all felt like we needed some scenes to maybe help with structure and continuity for the story. Uh, so I, I ended up writing, you know, maybe a handful of scenes uh, okay. it, for that. It's implied, but, it, it's, it, I appreciate the explanation, but the way the movie is presented out there is this, if you and Wayne Wang. Yeah, I mean, I guess movie. I was a co-writer because I ended up writing a few scenes and, and kind of being a consultant, but but you know, he really fiction, you know, he ended up fictionalizing a nonfiction piece. You know, I mean, the, the, my, you know, the, so the, the characters in the film are not the characters in my life. You know, my, the father character and his storyline is totally, you know, different. So well, I- Well, different setting. Yeah, different setting, different, you know, everything. Um, I mean, the essay is a nonfiction essay, so that's true. Um, but this is a fictional film in the end, which, you know, is, is fine and great. And uh, it's uh, a long, the, but the, the essay is from like 1995. This is yes, probably yes. before you even published the first novel, New Yorker. Yeah. yeah. It was just right at the same time, pretty much. And well, this has been, uh, been a bit, he, he was interested at what point it was, it was, it was oh, just a few years ago. Uh, okay. Wei Lang was and he'd read it again and he you know he was thinking about writing a story about a son and mother or or filming something and so it just appealed to him and he wanted to do it and so I thought oh great you know let him do it and um, so it, I, I think that for for me the film um, captures most truly it you know it doesn't matter what's true or not because it's a fictional film but 
but it does capture the, the relationship between mother and son, I think, from my memory, quite well. <laughs> um, you know, not that that matters. Uh, well, there's a lot in there. I mean, just directly out of the 1995 essay. Yeah, 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 for sure. Especially the mother and son yeah. parts. Yeah. It's a it's a quite of a moving movie. You know, I, I love the film. It it is yeah. really slow, and I I appreciate slow sometimes. I, I just think uh, like even watching book TV, just a talking head is far more interesting than a highly edited yeah uh, scene. Yeah. And I felt that just the camera outside the room where she's lying, uh, dying. Um, and the cooking, of course. That's why I ask you about the cooking. With uh, Chang Ray, the the character in the movie is quite quite the cook. It's a very nice spread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you also did a piece uh, for the New Yorker after your father died, uh, twenty eighteen, mm -hmm. and uh, he lived a long time after after your mother and what was uh, the relationship with him well he you know he remarried and uh, we had a we had a really good relationship i always felt as if my father was uh you know one of the most gentle generous um especially for a guy a korean man of his generation very open-minded um and probably was you know his his um blessing and sanction of what i wanted to do was huge to me you know where another another fellow of his generation would have said uh no i i didn't come to this country for my son to become a writer <laughs> you know uh and so um yeah unfortunately he had a tough time at the end he he had parkinson's and louis body syndrome and so it was a difficult difficult ending for him but, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, but it was good to, to get to know him a bit yeah, in yeah. reading that. Yeah. Uh, he also had a, uh, like Pong, coming here and escaping the, the uh, Chinese Revolution. Your dad, born in North Korea, and then moving to Seoul as a kid, he struggled and a lot of tragedy in his life early on. Uh, I love the elegance, not only of the the two stories, but also the the film. And I thought it was. It, I'm saying your sister, but the sister in the movie. Right. There's just a dignity to the family that they are. There's things of of disagreement, but just the. I don't know. Just a, a real elegance to do it. I, I sort of envy that. And I yeah, know well, he yeah, and that's uh, you mentioned that it's a, a very it's a slow and, and very you know methodical movie in certain ways. It's it it and Wayne and the cinematographer I think they did a wonderful job of just letting you see things, look at things, and not too many cuts and. Um, you know, just pretty simple shots, not two shots, you know, um, where it's always going back and forth between two people having a conversation. Yeah. Um, and that was partly due to, you know, just the small budget of it, but also, you know, definitely Wayne's aesthetic for the film. And so I think he made quite a beautiful film. He did. And he's yeah. a very fine filmmaker. I've enjoyed yes. a lot of things. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up and then bring some people in for questions. I just want to read one thing and saying goodbye to you here. This is uh, this is what Edmund White said about you and taught with Edmund White at Princeton. And uh, I feel the same way. Chang Ray Lee is a true author of globalization. As a friend and teacher, he is gentle but strong, wry but serious, boyishly curious, but completely adult. <laughs> and I believe the same thing. Thank you very much for being Thanks here. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me see if Erin is around. And I think she has some questions. I'm always lurking around somewhere. Um, a for, first things before we go to anybody else, I want to say um, us, 
you, you I think you're earlier in the program you said something about us being normal people, all of us. And I think anyone in the audience who's watching and listening to this is like, oh, you're not normal. You are just <laughs> extraordinary. You know, it's like, well, I mean, I'm a I'm an essayist, I'm a novelist. I could probably, if I could be, you know, like a chef or I would like to be like a cook and stuff like that, I can barely like get dressed in the morning. So I think that <laughs> that that um we are not at the same level. But the and the other thing I would say is um I love that that eight-year-old character was such a good cook because my kids and I have been watching in the pandemic Kids Baking Championship. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? No, you know? but I heard oh. about it. I heard about it, yeah. It is absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. These kids are 10 to 13 and they are making desserts that would just blow your mind. You know, it, it's actually gotten my family cooking and my, or not cooking, but baking. And my kid, my daughter just keeps saying, well, when I'm on kids baking championship, and I'm like, that's a great attitude. <laughs> it's just amazing what kids can do. So I, I 100% believe that character. Oh yeah. It's yeah. Am amazing. Um, so I don't wanna keep talking. I would love um, the people, I have one person that says, hello. This is very st strange. Um, very strange that we are not getting the the questions. Why are you guys so shy today? Because I can just keep talking. Um, uh, Ching Ray, I have a question for you. I'm just going to keep asking him. Um, okay, so you were recently on Seth Meyers, mm -hmm. but you were you were on from home, correct? Okay. Yes. Yes. Same bookcase behind you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So, um, and that was for this novel that we were just discussing? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, I guess my question is, um, would you think you were less nervous because you were at your house to be on, you know what I mean, on something national? Yeah, you, you, yeah. How, how do you think the difference between like how, how you you went into the process of being on that show. Would I'm have been sure. Different. Well, I'm sure I, I was less nervous, but, but, you know, I think we talked about it on the show. I remember, you know, you go to, you go to these shows, they have a green room and, and I think the green room is supposed to make you calm, but in fact, it makes you more nervous because <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're waiting there. And, uh, but I think it was, it was harder to talk in that way on it's hard, always hard to talk on zoom. You know in the end you know and that's what we're all of course waiting to do back and, and starting to do is like we love the world which is a lot what this book is about we need yeah. the world we and even people that we don't know strangers we need those people you know not to be intimate with but just to have around we need and and i've done a lot of zoom things for this book and I love the conversations, but to tell you the truth, they're hard to remember because I'm not in a room. I haven't been to a particular bookstore. I didn't mm -hmm. see the arrangement of the chairs. I didn't smell that room. I didn't see the weather. I didn't, there's no, there are no markers, human markers, mm -hmm. sensational markers with any of this stuff, which is why this is as, as best as we can do now. But, yeah. but I think that's what, we're reminded by about what what's happened in this last year is that we love the world and the uh, other thing is is that for writers who are supposed to write their experiences if the last year your experience has been your living room that yeah. has definitely um you know obviously you can go farther back but it's a block of time then that you've lost experiences Absolutely. Um, cynthia do you want to ask your question you just need to unmute yourself Hi, how are you? Um, I'm a teacher in Oak Park, Illinois, and I was so um, interested in your book. And I was just wondering, do you ever offer any workshops to um, adults, writing workshops, or just teach at your school? No, I just teach at my school. I, uh, you know, I'm pretty busy during the, the course of the academic year. So in the summertime, sometimes I'm asked to do conferences or colonies and stuff. But Okay. Uh, I just need my own time to yeah, do my I'm work. Sure. It, was just yeah. a, it was just a shot in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Thank hey, you. I think it's worth asking. <laughs> um, for your classes, um, how about how many 
um, is it about, is it a smaller classes? Like yeah, 15, they're writing classes. classes. Yeah, yeah the, between 10 and 15 usually. Yeah. And so oh they're writing gosh. workshops and so they have How to be small. How lucky would that be? Um, um, so this is a comment from Kathleen. I thoroughly enjoyed this webinar and look forward to reading this book. You developed a curiosity and interest for me to meet the interesting characters in your book, which is awesome. Hi, Georgia. Hi. Yes, I, I went to the book table and at the, when I went, it was when I first heard you were coming, the book, the only book they had was On Such a Full Sea. Mm -hmm. I completed this week and I'm just still stunned by the book. I, I would love to have you talk a little bit about Fan's journey. She's such a lovely person and you're so intrigued. I mean, it's again, it's such an, an unbelievable world that she encounters. Yet I kept, after I finished the book, I kept, as I read the newspaper, I keep finding these parallels to what ha is happening in our world all over the place. Every time I pick it, I pick up shot shortages hit four countries. Everything I pick up, the headline hits me that it's part of this book. Yeah. Not out of our reality. This is our reality. <laughs> I don't know. Just, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about that book, this book. Well, On Such a Full Sea is, as you know, uh, and for those of you who haven't read it, it's, uh, you know, uh, what they would say is a dystopian fiction. You know, it's set in a slightly different version of our own world. And, and it's a world beset with lots of problems, you know, uh, income inequality, uh, you know, environmental degradation, um, kind of totalitarian threat, um, and where people are just trying to, and particularly this character fan, um, who is another kind of innocent going about the world. I guess this is my time of life where I'm writing about innocence going out in the world and, and trying to, uh, uh, to show us what's going on there, you know, all the ills, uh, some of the evil, uh, and maybe, you know, in the course of things, trying to find something worthwhile and meaningful and, and good. Um, but she's, uh, you know, she's a character that I enjoyed writing because she was, I didn't want to give her, quote unquote, a lot of character, um, which is what you were supposed to do. But I wanted her to be more a vessel and a way for people to put in their own, like all the character people she meets ask so much of her they they want something from her and it's in a way she's a mirror to them and and it, she's a way for them to show you know all their sides both light and dark and uh and so uh, so that that was probably one of the things i intentionally thought about about her as as someone who's going about the world whereas tiller in this this new novel is completely different he's got a lot of quote unquote character <laughs> uh, which which is you know serves him in in different ways <laughs> uh thank you so we have time for one more question and so i'm going to end with um someone we um know very well um elizabeth you want to unmute yourself hi no <laughs> I don't want to. I want you. Hey, Chang Ray. Hi, Elizabeth. You know, nice to hear your uh, voice. What a what a pleasure to listen to you. I, I typed out this long question, but I, I just want to add to this question how interesting it was hearing you talk about this book and how ramped up I am to, to read it now. I was before, but now I really am. <laughs> um, but Bill and I did watch Coming Home Again last night. It's one of the loveliest films I've ever seen. And I appreciated how deliberate it was mm -hmm. and how honest it was yeah. and how, because it was so slow, it made you feel as though you were really there. Yes. I was particularly taken by the ending. I, it just, I'm starting to cry thinking about it just now. And I wondered if those were your words that were taken from what you did for the New Yorker. Yeah, in, in some part, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they, they use the essay for a lot of uh, the, the, you know, the dialogue and, and some of the voiceover. Uh, so, 
uh, yeah, it, and it was a kind of unsettling experience for me because, you know, I thought he was just going to make the film and the character would be called something else. But then the, when I first saw, the, when I saw the first guys like Chang Ray is here, and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> he's really doing it. <laughs> yeah, he's really doing it. And, uh, and, you know, his personality, the way that Justin Chun plays him is, you know, quite different from mine, but but again, you know, he's got to dramatize things and intensify things in a way that that makes it externally real on screen, right? My my essay is is all here, and it's just a lot of thinking and uh, and a lot of describing, of course. But um, but of course, he's got to embody it. And so that it, I, you know, his his portrayal um, is quite startling, which 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 I think is a good thing. Well. Awesome as well as the book, I'd highly recommend the film. We, it's readily available on cable, costs a couple bucks. You just uh, talk into the speaker, say, coming home again, and it'll be there for you to enjoy. <laughs> Talking to the speaker, it sounds ominous. Um, and of course, your books are available everywhere and anywhere. Um, and we always recommend you um, search out your local place first. <laughs> And then, um, you know, then go to Mr. Amazon if you're not able to find it. Um, but always try your independent place first. Um, I think that is it for now. Uh, Chang Ray, is there anything you want to add at the very end? Uh, nope. No, that's uh, nothing. I, I'm actually doing a, another Zoom event for the book, My Year Abroad, this coming Thursday for Bookstall in Winnetka. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, pop into that conversation just uh just ask bookstall oh that's that. really cool yeah awesome and bill do you want to plug uh, yeah yeah i, I do want to announce our next meeting uh, our next uh, event and that'll be on uh, sunday may 16th at two o'clock and my partner and elizabeth, novelist elizabeth berg who just came in uh <laughs> hi elizabeth well, she'll be interviewing the incredibly interesting and very funny Eileen Beckerman, author of the best-selling illustrated memoir, Love Lost and What I Wore. And I, I know you just met her the other day, Erin, and you're looking forward to this. I, I hope you all show up. I'm telling you, please do a search on her. She has a blog that Elizabeth uh, put me on, and it's just it's ridiculous. It's so great. I'm, I am, I mean, every month Bill and Elizabeth bring in the best people and they're all so different. So if you get ready to laugh in May. Um, so I'm excited and I'm going to do, uh, Elizabeth te, te, does this better than me, which is interesting because I'm the executive director, but, um, if you want to help us continue to put on these great programs, uh, go to our website, 19thCentury.org, and right on the homepage is a big old button that says Donate Here. And we really do need your help. You know, our doors have been closed pretty much for the last year. And um, any amount you can contribute really helps us continue to put on these great programs. We're so glad to have this partnership with Bill and Elizabeth and Writing Matters. And you are our partners too, because you come and you watch and you support us. So we appreciate you very much. All right. Well, everybody have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you gentlemen so much for being here today. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah, have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.